All right, am I ready to go now? You're all set. And everyone can hear me, great. Okay, thanks again everyone for having me and staying so late to listen to this talk. Um, thank you for the warm welcome, Tricia. It's, yeah, it's been a great partnership all of these years, um, having somebody, you know, uh, like Tricia on the ground and really taking the time to, you know, look at the broader picture where sometimes I can get very tunnel visioned in looking at just the insects and diseases. It's always great to have partners that kind of look at that larger ecology. And so today I am going to focus on, um, you know, the complex of, of disturbances because with the true furs, it, it really isn't as straightforward um, as it is sometimes with pines. And so there really are a lot of accumulating, but also independent, but co-pendent uh, disturbances that, you know, that work on our true furs in the Sierra Nevada. And so it really is a complex of these abiotic as well as biotic disturbances that happen. So, okay. Did it change slides pretty quickly or is it still delaying? <laughs> It's a little laggy, but it's not too bad. Okay, great. Um, all right, so some points that I that I hope to mention in my talk um, are talking about, and I think everybody wants to know, the current status of true furs in the Sierra Nevada. Mostly I'll talk about that in the central and southern Sierra Nevada that I'm most familiar with. Some, some information of, some of the causal factors that cause damage and mortality of true furs, how these factors kind of interact um, on their host and the effects that they have, and then some final things to consider. So just for clarification, um, you know, I'm only going to talk about the two species of furs that we have in the Sierra Nevada, the white fur and California red fur. Uh, you know, a lot of people hear Douglas fur, but it is not a true fur. And so it is not in the same, you know, genus as white and red fur. And we do have grand fur, but that's mostly along the coast. And so again, just mostly talking about these two species. True furs really have, um, they've really benefited in, you know, in the last century from past fire, you know, suppression management and strategies that we thought, you know, were good for the ecosystem back then. Um, really a great century of good precipitation, good water years, mild temperatures. So we didn't really have too many droughts in the last century. Um, and if we did, they were really short and they were pretty mild. Um, but true furs, just like you know, other conifers, are still under constant stress when, you know, when we do have droughts or when conditions aren't as favorable. So they feel that stress and pressure from abiotic as well as biotic. And mostly what we have in the Sierra Nevada are really just natives. We don't have any um, at least in the first, uh, any real invasives um, or, uh, you know, non-natives that we have to worry about. So native stressors like forest insects, diseases, as well as biotics like, you know, heavy wet storms and wildfires and wind events. When droughts do occur in California, as we know, um, you know, they come on these, you know, they seem to come on these cyclic events and they tend to be, you know, of a short duration, but they can be, or they're starting to be much more prolonged and severe. And when these droughts do occur, you know, we often do see a surge in true for mortality. So this is a graph of, you know, of, mortality that we have mapped from aerial survey as it correlates to uh, drought events or when we have precipitation that's below average. So 
when we have, you know, uh, these low consecutive water years, we usually see these surges in bark beetle caused mortality. And this is, you know, all bark beetles. So this is, and this is all, all tree species, species, so not just fur. This, um, this peak that happened in the early 2000s was our big outbreak that happened in Southern California around Big Bear Lake. And then we know this past drought um, that started around 2012 to 2016, we really started seeing that surge of mortality, particularly in the pines in the, you know, on the west side of the Sierras, just really just explode um, those two years of 2015 and 2016. And I want to apologize that this graph isn't you know, complete um, that, you know, that we are seeing surges in 21 and we're just now finishing uh, cleaning up a lot of our aerial survey information from 2022. So this line would actually be rising, um, you know, at this part of the screen. But what I wish I could show too is what happened in the early 1990s when we have this big surge that you could see um, uh, that's cut off at the end here. I've been told by folks that this is that that this drought event was uh, primarily um, losses in white fur and red fur. And you can see from the peak, and I don't really know how high it went up, that the losses that happened these years were even greater than what we'd experienced uh, these past couple of decades. So not surprising that we're seeing um, just, you know, continual mortality since, you know, uh, that it still really hasn't seemed like it stopped since 2016 when the drought was officially considered over. Um, we've had some wet years, but again, you know, we're still finding that the state is in a status of drought. And that in 2020, um, you could see here that most of the state was in severe to moderate drought and that it only intensified in 21 uh, where a good portion of the, the state of California was in exceptional drought and that we really haven't recovered even this year um, and that the Central Valley still remains um, in exceptional drought. So most of you have seen this on, on the landscape. This is the northern uh, part of the Stanislaus National Forest, the Calaveras Ranger District, where we're seeing you know, these hillsides, uh, fairly scattered mortality of red fur um, mortality. And you guys uh, closer to the northern areas this was taken from the Sierra Sun Times just this November. Uh, the photo was taken in October though, but yes, just a lot of new mortality here on the landscape. And then even in our most highest elevations that we, you know, we thought might have been buffered from having, you know, higher snow loads or possibly colder temperatures, we're still seeing a lot still of uh, mortality, especially in the red fur, and especially in this smaller, um, smaller size class. So this is Onion Valley and the Inyo National Forest. And if you got this in your email, like I did just recently, yes. that Oregon and Washington um, is experiencing what they call a firmageddon, where they are experiencing massive die-offs, probably the biggest that they've says your largest ever recorded in the region. So it's not just us, but they also have a few more species of fur that, than we do. So just stepping back a little bit and talking about, you know, again, the causal factors. So we know that drought plays, you know, plays into tree stress. Um, but again, you know, there's a lot of just kind of natural biotic agents that contribute to that mortality or add to it. And insects and pathogens have been found to be, you know, that significant 
a kind of back to ground mortality contributor. So even when times are good, you know, they're still in there working and, you know, causing some damage and causing disturbance. Um, they found out that, you know, biotic agents account for more than half of the mortality in true furs. Insects especially account for nearly half and pathogens account for a quarter of that. So, you know, insects and pathogens kind of work really in this accumulating stress spiral. So they can work independently of each other, but they can also just, you know, cause damage through, as they say, through a thousand cuts. So they can do a little bit of damage in localized area, but this again, just, you know, just accumulates over the long term. And these agents too can work in association with each other as well as working independently. So Trish, <laughs> a long time ago, um, did some studies down in, uh, down in fairly uh, similar forest types where, you know, wildfires were allowed to run, um, kind of run their course naturally. Uh, and this forest was uh, Sierra San Pedro Martir um, down in Baja, California, which is very similar to our forest types in California. And they still found that, you know, native pathogens and bark beetles still accounted for a large percentage of that mortality. So even though fires ran through those, those stands, it was still insect and diseases that caused a lot of the, the tree mortality. And 88% of the white fur uh, was caused by bark beetles. And that root disease, um, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, was also present in those stands. There was a larger component of pine and while the pines kind of, you know, kind of created some buffer with disease spread, they didn't really slow down. Um, uh, they didn't affect the intensity. So talking about bark beetles, because this is usually, you know, the primary kind of damage agent that gets talked about that causes most of mortality. And they do, you know, we have some very aggressive bark beetles here in California or in Western forests. And the one that gets blamed the most for a uh, majority of the fur mortality is, um, is this beetle called fur engraver. It does primarily you know, attack true furs. So all, all species of true furs. Um, so not just you know, white fur and red fur here in California. And it is somewhat different in its behavior compared to um, a lot of the other bark beetles that we know of, the more aggressive ones, uh, the more aggressive species like mountain pine beetle or Western pine beetle that attack our pines. This beetle works more on, on aggregating to find its, you know, find selected trees based on chemical cues that the host is putting out instead of the other way around where you hear about pheromone mediated attacks where beetles are aggregating by pheromones that they put out. It's the opposite for fur engraver, which is why they really, really have to search for those trees that have some either some prior injury or infection um, or that are already being attacked by other damage agents. And again, the tree is kind of putting out those chemical cues that it's stressed, that it's weak, and that it might be primed for attack. So again, it's not surprising that when we have drought events that are kind of adding to that stress, we see this you know, increase in um, fur, engraver, fur engraver infestations. And again, it's mostly a secondary, what we call secondary beetle, because it, it really still just kind of focuses on parts of the tree too that are weak. So if branches are um, scraped off or fall off or the tree is hit and has injury, you know, fur engraver will just attack like that little section. And so someone did an autopsy um, years ago looking at a large mature fur and that they found you know multiple attacks over the life of the tree uh, you know caused by fur engraver and the tree still survive so again as i mentioned before you know the true furs are still 
you know, every day or, you know, every year, depending on um, kind of those environmental conditions, whether or not you'll get a lot of attacks or you'll just get a few attacks, um, you know, by this beetle. And there are other agents, um, there are other insects that attack furs, you know, other groups such as wood borers, defoliators, um, like Douglas fir tussock moth that we have uh, happen in uh, uh, cyclic, uh, cyclic years and other engravers. And these are just to name a few. So, you know, again, I am not a pathologist, but I felt it's really important to talk about the pathogens and the parasites um, that, you know, we find most commonly in the true furs. And please correct me, Tricia. <laughs> I know you're listening if I say anything wrong. Um, but I wanted to focus on kind of the main ones again that we see the most often are the dwarf mistletoes. Um, and root diseases. So the dwarf mistletoes are a higher order plant. They're actually obligate parasites on their host. So they're actually parasitic plants that have male and female, um, you know, reproductive organs too that, you know, that create seeds and that is how they distribute themselves, you know, in the landscape. They are host specific on conifers. So if you have, um, so if you have, you know, mistletoes on firs, those will be the same mistletoes that will, you know, infect, um, infect, uh, infect pines, I'm sorry. And someone looked at, you know, that mistletoes themselves can actually be, you know, doubly infected by another pathogen. Uh, uh, called Cytospora, that 20% of these mistletoe infections are infected by Cytospora, which is actually a fungal canker. And Cytospora usually causes necrosis in areas, you know, where it attacks. So what it does is that it finds, you know, these damaged areas where um, mistletoe attaches, and then it just, you know, causes, um, you know, death of cells in those areas. So what happens is you might have, you know, uh, branch dieback from, you know, this, this branch being unable to conduct water to the rest of that branch. And so what you might see is again, branch dieback or terminal dieback. And unless you're looking for them, they can actually be really hard to find. So, you know, especially on young firs, uh, dwarf mistletoe can look a lot like the, the tree itself. And so it's really hard to tell if a lot of these trees even have pretty severe infections. Um, and, you know, again, unless you're actually looking for the plant and some of these plants too, right? Uh, like this little guy doesn't show any kind of symptom of, you know, of being weakened or being injured or being stressed by mistletoe, but you can tell this, you know, this infection level on this tree is actually pretty severe. So parasitic plants like dwarf mistletoe can really amplify the effect of, you know, of any kind of stressor or other damage agent that's already on these trees. And if you're like me, that most of the time when you're looking at a lot of really mature or large red or white furs, they don't really look that great <laughs> uh, most of the time, you know, well, some of them might have some green crowns. Uh, some of them can look really scraggly like this one. And, you know, and it's still alive and it's still, you know, um, creating cones and is still a seed tree, but you can tell that the tree itself is just not in good health. And it's not until, you know, um, parts of the tree die or it falls uh, and that it's, you know, closer to, to eye level that you're actually able to see, you know, again, what, what causal agents could have contributed to its death. And you can see from, you know, this close up that this poor little guy had a lot of dwarf mistletoe infections on nearly every one of its branches. 
I did want to talk about firm uh, true mistletoes very quickly because we do get asked about these as well. These are also parasitic plants, uh, but they're a completely different uh, type of plant compared to dwarf mistletoe. These only occur on white fir and mostly on larger uh, um, and mature trees. And you can see from this photo that, you know, these plants can also get very big and can, you know, and when they are this large, they can cause some pretty severe stress on these trees and even cause some breakage, again, of branches or, um, uh, or leaders. So I'm going to quickly hit on some diseases that we see in first. And the one that I'm going to talk about the most is this one um, called Heterobasidia and Occidentale. Uh, this name change was just recently, most people still know it as a nosum root disease. And this one is pretty hard to find again, unless you're looking for it, because as the name implies, it is a root disease. And so it can occur in trees that are still, you know, that are still alive, but this disease can be slowly, you know, what it does is that it slowly kind of rots the, the roots and the base of the plant. And so this does affect the integrity of the plant too, to also keep standing. And it's very hard to, you know, make confirmations um, of presence of this root disease in stands unless you can find, you know, old cut stumps or um, roots that have been blown over that you can dig down in the hole and actually, you know, find a, find a conch to confirm that yes, it is this disease. So the, again, the hard thing about this, you know, this disease is that it is occurring down in the roots. And even when the tree is dead, the fungus can actually still survive. And besides spreading by spores um, from the fruiting body, it can actually spread root, root to root underground. And so trees that are very, you know, that are similar species that are interconnected with infected roots can also become infected themselves. And so what you might notice is when you come into the stand and you see this, this type of opening, you'll notice that, you know, that there's, you know, there's dead trees in here. Uh, there might be some trees that have tipped over and broken, but um, if you take a closer look, you'll only notice that it's of maybe one or two, again, it'll be, mostly concentrated in the firs and that non-host species like the, like the brush or incense won't be affected. So someone um, back in the, you know, in the late eighties tried to do a survey to really see how much heterobasidian was really out there in the national forest. And they found at that time, found only about an 18% incidence of you know, heterobasidian in tree first stands in national forests. But they do say in their document oh that they really felt that this was an underestimate, you know, again, because it's so hard to find that it's really, you know, that they really feel that they're is much more of it out there that they're, that you're just not able to assess. Um, and recent studies have found that too well, you know, the amount of mortality and pest incidents out there, particularly in red fir forest ecosystems are still within kind of that natural range of variation um, that this can, you know, this can change for the worse that it has high potential you know, that we can have high potential for more losses due to additional stresses of climate change. And as we know, you know, abiotic disturbances also contribute to this. The, again, heavy wet snows that we have in these, you know, in these higher elevations, we are seeing a lot more stronger wind events. We've had several mono wind events um, 
you know, that have caused a lot of blow down. This is a photo of a red fir stand along Highway 88 that damaged not just dead trees, but also a lot of live trees and wildfires, as we know. So, you know, back to the drought, uh, back to our most recent drought and you know, what a lot of us are fearing is just going to happen again. You know, studies of that drought did find that, you know, white fir was kind of the third highest tree that was lost in, you know, all of the tree mortality that was counted. A good quarter of that tree loss was white fir. And that some, some of their, you know, their studies plot, study plots even found 100% loss of white fir. So it was pretty severe and, studies done in Sequoia Kings Canyon um, in their long-term study plot did find a lot of the mortality was, you know, caused by, you know, bark beetles in general, but for the white fur that it was all sizes and age classes that were affected compared to the pine, which is mostly focused in the larger diameters. And so, um, you know, I know probably many of you have seen this slide as well, that, you know, when we really started seeing just a um, lot more buildup of mortality by 2015. So this is, you know, a compilation of the mortality that we, that we were detecting from our aerial surveys up until 2018. And that even though we had that, you know, again, good water year, that, you know, the drought kind of still really never went away. Um, those dry conditions returned very quickly again, and that those in the Northern latitude really started seeing those effects and mortality start showing up. So, um, you know, just to keep talking about drought, you know, we know that, uh, you know, these, these last couple of decades really have been the worst drought you know, uh, since the last century, you know, and I, and I guess I want to emphasize that, you know, it's not just drought, but that these are, you know, in comparison, um, these are pretty severe droughts, even more severe than we've ever had in the past century. And then not just drought, but also incredibly hot temperatures in these, um, you know, in these past couple of decades. And, you know, in comparison to, again, when we had for the last century, we had really great, um, you know, low cold temperatures and only a few times where, you know, temperatures really went above that, above that average. Um, you know, so these hotter, drier, you know, conditions are happening all over the West. In California, we know most of the time we're in this really dark red, but that, you know, these even these northern latitudes are kind of feeling these same effects. So it's not surprising that Oregon and Washington, you know, suddenly have this firmageddon because it looks like they're about, you know, the same departures from normal that we're facing here um, in California. And, you know, density still is an issue. There still is, you know, a lot of trees in, you know, that, that have really not been there or, you know, our forests weren't this historically dense. You know, many studies have found that, you know, firs, um, you know, to their benefit are really prolific regenerators. They, you know, put out a lot of seed that gets established even in, you know, these kind of dark crowded conditions. And that because of that, they've really been able to move into areas that were previously dominated, um, you know, with pine, particularly down in the lower elevations. And because, you know, of past, you know, fire suppression management, you know, we really haven't been able to reduce a lot of this density um, and be able to catch up. So these trees that were established, you know, again, in those, you know, cooler, um, cooler wetter, you know, climates are just, you know, and now really trying to adjust to these much hotter, drier conditions, you know, are these larger kind of older trees. We're really losing those larger diameters. 
And with climate change, um, you know, as more trees become weak and stressed, you know, this benefits bark beetles as well as other damage agents because there are more, you know, now susceptible hosts on the landscape for them to infest. And so we may not be able to sustain kind of the current density or range of where we find some of these firs in the future. So, you know, uh, fur mortality right now is currently at high levels in the Sierra Nevada, as you know, but also across Western forests. And our aerial detections have found that mortality was much more greatly elevated this year uh, in comparison to last year. And that it looks like, you know, in comparison to the last drought too, that this time a lot of that mortality is in the truth or greater than 70% so far is what they've estimated uh, mostly to actually be true for uh, killed trees. And I've, you know, I, I found in, you know, in my experience um, in the Sierras that firs themselves just seem to be a lot more susceptible to, to their native biotic, biotic agents um, in comparison to pines. A lot of the larger diameters, you know, like I showed you with that aut autopsy, um, just been on the landscape uh, a lot longer. And so they have this higher accumulation of insect of agent, you know, incidents, incidents as well as presence. Um, and if, you know, if drought severity and intensity are expected to increase, um, like a lot of our predictions show, and even healthy and vigorous trees, you know, might eventually become susceptible. And so finally, just some things to consider. Some management, you know, can be done and especially, you know, should be done to, you know, protect people and infrastructure and property. Uh, but we need to, you know, kind of reconsider the bigger picture too, that are, you know, where white fur is occurring, are they, are they the best trees for that site? Um, is the number of trees, uh, you know, for certain stands that even if they've been that way for as long as we've known, is that, is that stocking or density, you know, probably good when we think about future stand conditions or future stand, you know, uh, climates? And are the trees themselves, are the current trees on this, on those stands, you know, vigorous? Do they have uh, heavy dwarf mistletoe infections or true mistletoe, or has there been, you know, root disease detected in those areas? Just some things to consider. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for your patience. And I'll, you know, I'll be around to answer questions to the best of, <laughs> to the best of my abilities. But if you have any pathology questions, Trisha is right there. Thank you.